Hi everyone, welcome to the Keenan Yoga Podcast and well, it's just me today, Adam. Um, so I wanted to share with you a few thoughts on my own since these days I don't much speak with the guests uh, on the guest podcast, I let them explain and uh, present their points of view. So here you are, <laughs> finally, once again, you get to hear my point of view. Well, where best to start? I think the obvious place to start is the rules of Ashtanga. You know, I like the rules of Ashtanga and how they do work and how they don't work or, or what they're meant to work for and when to break them and when not to break them or what to keep and what to throw away. So this is my point of view. Um, as you're listening, maybe make some notes or have a little think and let me know your point of view in the comments because it's a two-way dialogue and really, you know, a point of view is just a point of view. Um, and uh, I could probably change it in the next <laughs> in the next number of months anyway. So no, not really. Um, I have been thinking about this for many years because I have the tendency to be compulsive, obsessional, uh, rigid around the practice, to be quite honest with you. And um, it took me a long time to kind of loosen the fetters of a practice that's meant to be for life and uh, and for, for for spreading out into life, as it were, to, to be more open, uh, more receptive, more involved, uh, more free, really, you know, and less uh, constricted. And I have to say, after the initial buzz of uh, getting involved in yoga and then Ashtanga, first of all, it did tend to actually make me close down a bit as I became rather rigid with the rules and uh, what had to be done and in the exact way. Um, and I think I'm not alone here in saying that because I think many people have had this experience that what serves them at the start tends to become, after a while, increasingly claustrophobic in almost kind of shuts down life rather than opening up more, makes you less spontaneous, more controlling, more uh, selfish in a way as you try and preserve the practice in exactly the way it ought to be, uh, more uptight than less so. Anyway, uh, moving on. So the rules of Ashtanga, as they are presented by many teachers, let's say, still presenting, that you have to do a six days a week practice, that it has to be your exact practice every time, i.e. what you've learnt with them or what you've learnt in Mysore, you have to do that every time, you know, even if you're tired <laughs> or injured <laughs> or disinclined. Uh, you have to do that every day, six days a week. Rest on moon days and uh, weekends. Or one day used to be, uh, I think, a Saturday. Now I think it's changed to the Sunday rest day. But anyway, rest on Monday. Um, Maybe we could even say rest on the very particular day that's now uh, said to be the day of rest, <laughs> the holy day of rest in my soul. I'm joking apart, you know. I mean, these the thing is with these rules is that they're man-made, you know, and they're for, and originally they were for you, right? Um, and as you can see, they become taken so literally when you know in India they're never taken so quite so literally. I feel I think it's the Western mind that takes the rules literally, whereas in in India the rules are still there, but you know they can shift. You know, there could be a rule and less, less kind of compulsiveness around the rules, perhaps. If you've ever been to India, you'll realise that that's a necessity in the, in, the, in the crowded Indian cities, etc. Anyway, so you have to do it six days a week, exact practice. Vinyasa has to be exact. Oh, you have to know the exact vinyasa, when to look up, when to pause, yeah, when to inhale and exhale, right? You have to know that. Uh, no modifications, of course, right? You can't uh, amend a posture. And if you can't do a posture, that's that. <laughs> Closing right and uh, you have to stay at that posture right until you can complete it right you know not only can you not amend a posture say if you're injured or say if you just feel really stiff today and tired and you just want to take it a little bit easy no you can't do that <laughs> and nor can you uh move on to the next posture in a series unless you've done the last one let's say perfectly what does that mean it means completing the shape of the posture um and as you might know if you've read any of my stuff, I'm not really interested in the shape of the posture. So let's start there. So the shape of the posture, to me, doesn't matter. What we're looking for is the essence of the posture. The essence of the posture is the question of connectedness. Is the whole body connected in the in whatever shape you're performing, right? And is the function of the posture being recognized, right? If it's a twist, are you able to twist one way at the top, the other way at the bottom? Yeah. Is there two oppositional forces in the posture, at least a push and a pull, right? Is there a sense of trying to balance the... The, the force of the posture, not in pushing out of yourself, but in pulling back towards yourself. So you create an equilibrium in the body. Yeah. So that's my interest in the posture. And when I say a posture is perfect, it's nothing to do with the quantifiable shape. Okay, your legs here, you're in lotus, blah, blah, blah. 
whether you're in Lotus or not, for example, Mary Charles B, uh, you know, many points where you, you, you might have trouble with a knee or trouble with a Lotus altogether with a tight hip. And, you know, you can get the essence of the posture without doing the full shape. So first of all, I suppose I fall afoul of the rules very, very categorically there in as much as, um, even amending the posture for the essence of the posture. So, I mean, my point of view is that early in my you had two series taught very quickly in, in as much as let me qualify that when the first people went to my David Williams and Nancy yeah, being the first, some of the first, not exactly the first, but you know, the more or less the first, the Western teachers, they were taught first series and second series in about three months, more or less. Nancy was taught a therapeutic version with a lot of the postures amended more for her. David Williams was taught as it is more, more or less the, the postures very similar to what they are now. Um, and, quickly right and they didn't even realize that they would be taught different series it was kind of like one long series and the back bends uh the daniel Arsenal, you know the back bend you do at the end of primary now that came out at the end of second right so for me it makes perfect sense not to put the back bend on until you've done at least a little bit of second series intermediate series as it's known now even if you can't complete primary series Put on those early back bends of the intermediate series, you know, regular bow on your stomach and shallabas and a locust when you're on your stomach with your feet and your body, your upper torso in the air. Some of those early back bends, maybe camel, they help with the full back bend. So I think there's a pragmatism that one can take in one's approach without becoming so far off beam, so far off piste, as it were, that you're no longer doing Ashtanga, right? And the vinyasa thing, and getting the vinyasa count exactly correct. Well, the vinyasa is there for concentration. It's there for concentrating your breath, right? So it's as much important in the breach as the observance. Listen to that again. I think the vinyasa, even not doing the vinyasa exactly when it doesn't, when it's not relevant, like for example, jumping into Marichasana D on one breath, all into the posture, right? Not doing that and noticing that you can't do it is as much it's as, it's as useful in noticing and not doing the vinyasa as in keeping with the vinyasa count of the breath exactly. Yeah. The point is the concentration on the breath. And then there's certain points when the inhale or the exhale functions particularly in entry or exit of a posture, right? If you're lifting on an exhale, yeah, it's much easier to lift on an exhale. Um, if you're pulling away from your body and lifting or elongating the spine, that's more helpful to do on an inhale breath. Right? So, so somehow, sometimes the vinyasa inhale, exhale is particular and pertinent and relevant and it's useful to know, but you'll kind of figure that out yourself really. I mean, it's not, it's not really rocket science to know when you're pulling into yourself. That feels better on an exhale as the diaphragm pulls up and in. It pulls the body together in a more flexed position on the exhale. When you're expanding away from yourself, like an opening of the chest, let's say, yeah. elongating the spine. You're doing that on an inhale breath. Yeah. So look at the sun salutations, hands up, inhale, fold forward, exhale. And just universalize that principle in when you're breathing. To know the vinyasa, well, you know, I think it's useful to know anything you're doing in detail. If you want to do something seriously and you're taking it seriously, then, you know, you know, one would probably try to learn the details of it, you know, to keep it, you know, to keep it neat and tidy or, or that's a better way of saying that perhaps, but just to be really conscientious about what you're doing and not sloppy, you know, like um, there's a great book called uh, Mastery by George Leonard. And he talks of uh, three different types of practitioner. I think I, I put it on a, an Instagram post at some point. And one of them was the hacker. Right? So I was the hacker, just hack into, you know, Oh, I want to do this posture, that posture, no understanding of the breath movement in it, no consciousness of when to inhale and exhale, you know, just hacking away at the series. Oh, I want to do that one now. Let's have a go at that one. So it all becomes a little bit loose, a little bit sloppy. Concentration is a bit lacking. I think it's helpful to keep the edges of anything you're doing and it keeps the mental edges of the mind. You know, you kind of think the mind likes to be really, really precise. Uh, that's how it concentrates in 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 ma in um, honing in or magnifying the detail, so it, the consciousness becomes really focused. And the whole idea of yoga in the first place is one pointed concentration, ikagata, concentration, one pointed place of focus, right? So, yes, vinyasa. Um, yes, you've got to breathe. Yes, it's nice to know it. Is it essential to know it? Do you have to know it? Well, you know, if you're particularly someone who doesn't, you know, learn those kind of things very easily, you know, no, don't feel guilty about it, for God's sakes. You can practice without it. At the end of the day, let's look, let's come back to what we're looking for 
in these rules, you say the so-called rules of Ashtanga, right? You know, well, they're focused on the breath and then they help with consistency of mental focus and kind of determination, I suppose, or, or consistency and methodicalness, let's say. Yeah. And that's what the rules are there for. They're for you, not the other way around, right? So you use those rules to keep your kind of, to keep your mind centered and focused and methodical and consistent. Yeah. And outside that, when they don't work for you, put them away. So oftentimes, you know, if you're not in Mysore or on a yoga retreat or, you know, somewhere you can focus 24 seven, your own yoga, right? You know, which is most of the time for most of us, right? Have jobs, family, other responsibilities, right? The yoga is meant to help that. And you've heard that before, right? The yoga is meant to help and not get in the way of that. So, you know, six days a week practice, the whole practice is crazy for most people, you know? It's going to burn you out. And the main thing is you don't want to quit. The main thing is you want to do this for a long period of time because it's only after 15, let's say, you know, to be quite honest, you know, 15, 20 years, I mean, in my experience, it may be quicker for you. You may be not so, so stubborn and pig-headed as I am. You know, after a long time, you really get to, to start to understand what you're doing. You know? And can I explain that further? Maybe not. You know, just, just, just that consistency over a long period of time. As it's said in the Yoga Sutras, and you know, I'm no huge fan of the Yoga Sutras, as you might know. But as it's said in the Yoga Sutras, and the quote I do like, and Batabi Joy is actually one of his favorite quotes as well. You practice, practice needs to be for a long time consistently like the right a similar approach not just like doing different things different days and the, today i fancy this right? you know consistency over a long period and with the right attitude yeah. well that's another question this right attitude and i think that builds over time right i started with a mixed attitude and to some degree i have still a somewhat mixed attitude if i'm patently honest i'm you're not completely practicing for the sake of um in one is with God or, or one is even myself. You know, there's still some enjoyment of the physicality of it and uh, some appreciation of what the body can do. You know, so there's still some superficial motives there, I think, with all of us, you know, until you haven't got an ego at all. It somewhat motivates you and you, you can use it skillfully. Yeah? The same with practice. Use, it, use the rules skillfully. Don't let them break you. Because if you're doing it for a long time and you're doing it in this kind of manner, I've got to do it every day. And if I don't do it when I'm meant to do it, then I feel super guilty. And it's just going to, you're going to break under the weight of it after a while. It's going to feel like there's no joy in it anymore. The whole joy is going to be squashed out of the experience. And then, then it's not efficient because, because you have to have some sense of, Oh, how do we say? It's not exactly joy. I don't say like I look forward to the practice kind of yippee every time or or relish it, you know, even doing it oftentimes, you know. But you have to have a sense of not not dreading it or not re uh, resenting it, you know, being open and being, you know. Otherwise, when you're in it, doing it, you don't feel there's no sense of curiosity. There's no sense of kind of openness of mind. And that's the, the essential factor of the practice to continue it well not only to continue it but to to kind of make headway with something yeah with some connection to yourself or however you envisage or whatever you envisage you're doing yeah you close in and feel claustrophobic and feel trapped by it then you just tend to have this kind of stubborn pushing i've got to get through it and you kind of close down over it i suppose let me what does i say i suppose yeah so yeah, six days a week, practicing exactly as you should every single time, even if you're tired, even if your kids have kept you up all night or you've got problems with the boss at work. You're ill, you know. It just doesn't work. You've got to respect and your body, respect the demands of life. And it's tough. Of course, it's tough for everyone. The whole point is sometimes you feel lazy and sometimes you do need to tell yourself, no, I can do it, you know. I mean, that's true, you know. As many times I used to have this, I, I think I might have said this before to some some of you listening that, you know, every time I used to practice in the evening, where, you know, I mean, I mean, I used to practice in the evening and every time I used to do it, <laughs> every time I was pr climbing the stairs after work, coming back from work in this organic health food shop, I remember feeling ill every time. I saw today, I'm sure I'm coming down with a flu or something every single time almost. It was completely a big bit of the imagination. Yeah, because I didn't want to focus my mind and, and move my body so so chat in such a challenging manner. So so you know, you know, once I'd done it, I realized, okay, just the mind's tricking you. So it's hard to know whether it's a trick, whether it's laziness, whether you need to say, no, you're gonna do it. 
or whether it's need, you know, as a message that needs to be respected. I can't help you there. You know, I think it's something, again, this thing of doing it over a long period of time, you start to recognize yourself, right? You start to have a sense of integrity where you know what you are and you know when you're tricking yourself, right? I think it tends to, it tends to open up a sense, a degree of clarity in your own self with the very, very much to do with this battle of, of not wanting to do it. And then, you know, feeling like sometimes you're pushing yourself to do something you really shouldn't because you're tired or burnt out, you know? So yeah, coming back to the rules on modifications now, modifications and staying in the same posture, right? So, you know, as I mentioned before with David and Nancy, Nancy was given a lot of modifications to kind of complete, I think, the rough shapes of primary and intermediate series in a period of a few months because they seem to have a certain, I don't think they're God given. I don't think they're a magic combination locked to enlightenment, the series. I think that they were, they were made up between Patabi Joyce and Krishnamacharya. And most people will agree with that now, but they seem to have some sense of rhythm and progression and, and, and kind of rationale to them. And, you know, I mean, you know, Krishnamacharya was very keen on the Vinyasa Kramer idea, right? Building one posture to the next. So, you know, and it's likely he wouldn't have just given Patabi Joyce free reign to make up whatever series he wanted, you know, because you've heard the thing about Patabi Joyce being the, the master of demonstrations, right? In the Mysore, and they had to give these demonstrations all the time for the Maharaja of Mysore to the public, to the general public. So Patabi Joyce started doing, you know, putting together sequences of all the postures that they, they, all the boys were taught in the Mysore Palace by Krishnamacharya, but they were taught all different things. All the boys taught different things at different times, it seems, it appears, although it's very hard to get a completely straight answer. And then Batavi Joyce kind of, along with Krishnamacharya, I'm sure, because he was a complete control freak, I think, and you know, taskmaster would never have just allowed Batavi Joyce to make up whatever he wanted for the demonstrations. They put together the series, you know. The series is a kind of, I mean, this, and this, I suppose, is, you know, useful to mention at this point, in fact, that they're, they're only blueprints. And I think the mythology around the yoga karunta and the exact vinyasa and the fact that there's something very sacred about these particular sequences and keeping them perfectly and pristine exactly how they are. And if you do them exactly how they are, then something special happens to you. You know, <sighs> I'm not going to poo-poo it completely. I'm not going to reject that idea because it's a working myth. I think myths are really good at the start of practice. You know, having ideas that are idealistic, for God's sakes, you know, that, that inspire you. There's something greater. There's so, and and they, they work because we're emotional beings. And, and we, you know, I don't think we're really rational beings. And we trade on symbol and ideals to motivate us. It's emotional. So I think these ideas of the yoga karunta, et cetera, et cetera, useful at the start, useful at the start, perhaps less so as you go along and you need to be more pragmatic about things, right? And then it's like over time, you know, you know the scales, you know the blueprints. Now you know you're, you're old enough, ugly enough, smart enough, whatever, to know when to amend them for yourself. Yeah, because over time you're going to have to do that. Your body, all our bodies don't do all things perfectly. So you're going to need to make modifications to suit your own body, and especially as you get older or injured, etc., etc. It only makes sense. And, but coming back to the series is, I think it's useful to have a rough shape of both series, especially as the intermediate series happens to be a lot about the backbends. And that's helpful to, to as, a, as a counterpoise, as a contrast to the forward folds of the primary series, most obviously, right? So we can all make a rough shape. Some perhaps postures left out. Not everyone's leg will go comfortably behind the head. Not everyone will do Kapitasana. If you haven't started doing that posture when you're young, for example, the back does get a lot more rigid. I'll tell you for nothing as you get older, even if you could do it, yeah? especially if you start as you're older. And most of us have started when we're older than a 12-year-old boy as was trained in the Mysore Palace, right? So knowing all that... <laughs> You have to treat the postures with a pinch of salt in a way. Consistency. Remember, the rules are there for consistency, for a methodical approach, for, for pinpointing your consciousness, for keeping you on program, motivated. Because also, you know, if you've got the sequences, it helps with a sense of progression, right? You can kind of see doing the same thing every day. You kind of how you progress or how you do. Yeah. 
And also having the set sequences, it takes the focus off the sequences themselves, right? So they become rather ritualistic in as much as the thing isn't about the thing itself anymore because that's the same. The thing is about more the person doing the thing than the thing. You see, if you do the same thing every day, like any ritual, every routine, any routine and a, a routine that's been made special is a ritual. It's been made sacred. It's been pointed out and done on purpose. It becomes from routine to ritual. And that means that the awareness is thrown back on the doer of the routine, the doer of the ritual rather than the action itself. Anyway, so modifications and stopping where you are and perfecting that posture. Now, if you're 20, if you're a young person, maybe not 20, but even 30, or maybe if you're very fit, even older, <laughs> it depends on the person. Maybe they should stop at a certain place and really co focus their energy on that thing, on that posture for a little bit of time. But if it's not happening, you know, and the teacher should be able to judge how their body's responding and, you know, how it's going for them, right? Then after a period of time, let them move on. They get There's later postures in the series that will help the earlier postures. It tends to release a bit of pressure around doing that posture right to move on. You know, it releases that pressure and then releases that pressure. Sometimes it just kind of happens, yeah? And also if you're just pushing against the posture every day, more and more frustratedly, that's likely to injure you anyway. A good example of this is the backbends. Now, we know that they didn't come at the end of primary in the first place. But this idea of standing up after the backbends before you can do intermediate series is crazy. You know, it just makes people push and push into their backs when they're not really ready to do so, to stand up to do more postures. Because let's be honest, the primary series is painted with the with a limited color palette, to say the least. There's not that many things to do in it. You know, you want to do more postures, natural variation little bit of variation after a couple of years, you should do more postures. You know, this idea that people being stuck on primary series for, you know, 20 years, or maybe I exaggerate, but you know, it's just crazy. It's imbalanced. It's crazy. It, you know, it's very, um, I don't know, uh, how do you say it? Un, uninspiring after a while, basically. And it doesn't allow them other postures that will actually help their progress in the primary series. So, you know, it's, Perfecting a posture, well, it depends on the person, uh, you know, staying there a little while, or focusing extra specially on that particular movement in the body, repeating it a few times, helpful. After a while, it becomes very unhelpful, uninspiring, demoralizing, and often causes injury. So basically, after a while, I don't agree with that rule either. But to return to the start, to return and to conclude this little, little episode, whatever we want to call this tirade or rant, I think that, you know, we have to be practical over time to the rules or they will break us, right? So it's either us or the rules, whichever goes first. And there's a difference between practicing a mice or practicing, you know, now and again in a teacher's class when you want to do it as according to mice or et cetera, and your daily practice. And if someone, a teacher doesn't allow you to do a daily practice and flow with the ebbs and flows of your own life in a way that's, still consistent, methodical, concentrated, then I feel that's a bit of a problem, you know, because we're organic beings. We're not robots. We're not computer programs that just fire up and do the same every day. And that organicness should be, should be honoured. You know? We can't just do the same thing every day happily. You know? And over time, you'll know when to start and stop, when to modify and when to not. But maybe, first of all, a teacher who's, practical around the walls let's say traditional non-traditional maybe you know i still love the tradition i still think it's very motivating very inspiring and doing something which is the same every day and keeping those little details the same those little details of the ritual there's something about that's very special but too literal and it'll break you so i guess as always it's about the dose yep uh, it could be the poison if it's taken into a higher dose for a little bit of uh, structure, a little bit of determination and keeping your edges, keeping your corners, you know, discipline is, you know, incredibly helpful for life as well. So I haven't got anything better to conclude on, but I suppose the best uh, note to conclude on would be to ask you what you think. I really would honestly like to hear from you. Um, and uh, yeah. Let me know if this has been at all of interest or relevance and uh, what you want to hear me talk on next, because 
I do have a lot to say, if you hadn't noticed already. <laughs> so I hope you find some of it of interest. Anyway, I hope you're well. And uh, thanks for listening and supporting the Keen Yoga podcast. It's been almost three years ago now. And to be honest, I've absolutely loved every minute of it. And it's been such an honor to be uh, put in the position of of doing this for the community and for everyone. So so thank you for, for giving me that, that privilege and for listening and supporting it. Right. I'll see you again soon.